Welcome, good evening, good to see you all and glad everybody made it out tonight. Wednesday, first Wednesday in March, and we are excited March is here because around here, March is Missions Month and we love Missions Month, so auditorium hopefully, if I get around to it, will look a little different Sunday if I'm able to uh, get our flags up and things that we like to do as we uh, go to a time of missions emphasis. But tonight, uh, we're going to kind of kick off that theme with a song that has to do with bringing people to Jesus, and that is bring them in. It's all about the imagery of shepherd and sheep. Jesus told the parable of the lost sheep and uh, how the shepherd leaves the 99 to find the one that's lost. Praise the Lord. That was you and me. Amen. We were that one. And he didn't think that we weren't worth finding, weren't worth saving. Praise God for that. Let's stand together and we will sing three verses of this. Bring them in. Bring them in from the fields of sin. Hark, tis the shepherd's voice I hear Out in the desert, dark and drear Calling the sheep who've gone astray Far from the shepherd's fold away Bring them in, bring them in Bring them in from the fields of sin Bring them in, bring them in Bring the wandering ones to Jesus Who'll go and help this shepherd kind Help him the wandering ones to find Who'll bring the lost ones to the fold Where they'll be sheltered from the cold Bring them in, bring them in Bring them in from the fields of sin Bring them in Bring them in, bring the wandering ones to G. One more. Out in the desert, hear their cry. Out on the mountains, wild and high. Hark, tis the master speaks to thee. Go find my sheep where'er they be. Bring them in, bring them in. Bring them in from the fields of sin. Bring them in, bring them in, bring the wandering ones to Jesus. Amen. Those fields can be deceptive. They don't all look like uh, slums and ghettos and uh, third world poverty stricken. They can be corporate America. They can be Hollywood. They can be suburbs. Wherever there are people, there are sinners, and wherever there are sinners, they need the gospel. They need Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. There was no field uh, that he wasn't willing to go to to find us. Amen. I'm going to ask Brother Jeff, would you pray to start our service tonight? Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Let me say a word or two about Missions Month while I am at it. We've got uh, right now three mission, no, four, sorry, four missionary guests that are going to be with us, three on Sundays and one next Wednesday. So this coming Sunday, we're going to have a young single lady missionary, Katie Dilfer, is going to South America, or South America, South Africa. There's a difference. They're not the same. Uh, She's going to be with us all morning. Now she'll be Um, sharing her testimony and presenting her burden, sharing how the Lord called her to missions and talking about the need in South Africa. She's going to be doing that in the Sunday school hour at 9 o'clock. So really encourage you to be here for that, be here in person, and encourage her in that way. And that's where you'll hear uh, most about her work and her life and what the Lord's calling her to do. She'll be with us in the 11 o'clock service as well, and she'll have about 10 minutes uh, to kind of reprise some of that for the folks who weren't able to be with us at nine. But I encourage you to be here at nine to, to hear from the missionary. And uh, she's also, she sings 
and plays the piano. I, I think that's what she told me. I know she sings, so we're going to pretend like she can play the piano, and maybe I'll be right when she gets here. Um, but she said she'd be willing to do special music, so we're going to hear her um, present some special music. That's this Sunday. Next Wednesday, we have Ron and Tara Black are going to be with us. They are the relatively new directors of the Lighthouse Children's Home. We've been supporting the Lighthouse Children's Home for a long, long time. Brother Larry Neff started the Children's Homes and uh, recently retired after a long, long time serving as the director of Lighthouse Children's Home. So Brother Ron wanted to come and uh, officially meet us as the director. So they're going to be here next Wednesday. Come and hear about the work of the Lighthouse Children's Homes next Wednesday. Fantastic work they do. They've got homes in Panama, Mexico, Thailand, um, all over the world, and they, they do a fantastic job. So that'll be next week. On the 24th, no, you, that's what preacher said, 21st, no wait, 14th, next Sunday. I'm all kinds of confused. I should have had this written down. Um, on the 14th, we're going to be having... Um, with us, Andy Smith and his wife are going to China with Vision Baptist Missions, and uh, they'll be with us again in the morning. And then on the 21st, we'll have Ricky Howard and his family. They are church planners going to Utah. Um, If the last year, I said this, I think, a couple months ago, if the last year has not proven that America is a mission field, I don't know what to tell you. We need church planners in America. We need missionaries to go to America. And uh, so we we are big believers in uh, U.S. missions as well, home missions. So we're excited to hear about their work in Utah. That's Missions Month, and uh, we do Faith Promise Missions here. If you don't know what that is or what that means or how these missionaries get to the field, come Sunday morning um, because that's what I'm going to be preaching on, Faith Promise, and uh, we're going to explain how that works, challenge you to dig deep and give sacrificially to take the gospel to the world. All right. Tonight, now we're still going to be doing our miracles series just for the month of March, but they're going to be miracles with a, with a uh, missions emphasis, okay? So turn to Mark chapter 2, and we're going to talk tonight about a miracle for a friend. A miracle for a friend. Or you could say we're going to talk about bringing others to Jesus. Mark chapter 2. This miracle is found in the first 12 verses of this chapter. And we're going to read that in just a second. Um, are you typically general, genuinely very happy when uh, a friend of yours gets blessed tremendously? Maybe unexpected blessing. I think we all know the feeling of we are genuinely joyful when good things happen to other people, right? We are. I think you probably would if you were honest, could also say that sometimes when we see a really good unexpected thing happen to a friend, we're happy for them, but at the same time, we kind of wish it was us. How many of you have ever had that happen to you? Yeah, I think everybody can can understand that. Um, I think this is kind of the double-edged sword of children's parties. Children's are not, children are not emotionally... Uh, developed enough to avoid this at least I wasn't when I was a kid so that's the problem when you know you go to a birthday party as a kid and you're watching your friend open presents do you know how emotionally conflicting that is because on the one hand like it's your friend and you want him to open a present and it'd be something really cool because that'd just be cool you know and kids just gravitate towards cool stuff but at the same time, you kind of don't want him to get something that's too much cooler than what you got. You know, you, you got that emotional conflict there, but we know that feeling. Why do we feel that way? Why do we sometimes struggle to be happy when others are blessed? Well, the reason is we're all inherently selfish. We're all inherently selfish. We're all sinful people. We get it naturally. We're born with it. And our first instinct is for us. It's to put me first. It's what I want. It's my way. Um, I should get the good stuff. I deserve it. You know, that's what we like to tell ourselves. We, we would probably never say that out loud, but that's how we feel is that we want things for ourselves because we deserve it. Um, sometimes that shows up more obviously in children, but as adults, we have those feelings too. And we try to hide it. You know, we'll say, I'm so happy for you on the outside. And you smile, but on the inside, you're like, 
listing all the reasons why you deserved it more than they did or why they didn't deserve it or whatever like that. Now, here's the thing. If you, if you don't rein in that kind of behavior when you're young, when you get to be old, you're going to turn into a very cynical, sarcastic, ne- negative, complaining, bitter person, um, and it will really corrupt your, your nature. When you come to Christ... The Bible tells us that love for others is one of the things that the Holy Spirit produces in a believer. Genuine love for others. This is bigger than just being happy somebody got a cool birthday present, although maybe that would be included. But God will produce in us genuine love for others. The same kind of love that Jesus had for us is what God is trying to produce in us for others. Love for others that is from God, that kind of love, will compel us to desire another person's good. Not just the, the small time type of good things like cool birthday presents, but genuine good, life blessings, spiritual blessings. When God begins to develop love in you for others, then you'll develop godly compassion, the kind of compassion that is not content just to hope for something good to happen to somebody else, but that takes action to try to make something good happen in somebody else's life. You see where I'm going with this, I hope. Um, This is the work of missions, that God works in us to produce love, Christ-like love, which compels us to seek the good of others because we genuinely love them. And the number one need that other people have is Jesus Christ. The number one need that the world has is to know the Savior. The number one need that they have is to have their sins forgiven. And when you are filled with the love of Christ, that will be your desire as well to see others come to know Jesus Christ because that's the best possible thing that could happen to them. So as Christians, our number one desire for others should be for them to know Jesus, for them to have a relationship with God, to have their sins forgiven. I believe here in Mark chapter 2, this is, to me, one of the most moving stories in all of the Gospels. It's a story of four men who help bring one man to Jesus for healing. Now, I'll refer to these men as four friends, okay, who are helping their friend. To be fair, the Gospels do not say that they are friends, but I can't imagine a person being more of a friend than to work this hard to bring somebody to Jesus for healing. So I'm going to call them friends, because I think this is what a true friend would do. This man, as we'll find out in just a second when we read it, he had palsy. That's the the Bible word there in our King James Version anyway. Um, That word palsy refers to a paralysis of some kind. It was pretty broad. Um, That word in English, palsy, we don't use it much anymore. That was a hand-me-down from an old French word. Um, But the Greek word is where we get the word paralysis. You may have heard uh, this miracle be called the healing of the paralytic man. It comes from that same Greek word. So it, it means a paralysis of some kind. Now, in Bible times, um, this palsy could be several different things, and it could show up in different ways, okay? It could be a sudden loss of motor skills that could happen on just one side of the body, or it could happen on the entire body from the neck down, It could be that, just a loss of ability to to move, control over your muscles and your movement. It could be a sudden contraction of muscles, which eventually resulted in the withering of the limb that was affected. So same affliction when um, Jesus healed the man with the withered hand. His muscles had contracted contracted to the point where they were not used anymore. They deteriorated and atrophied, and they his limb shriveled up. Same type of thing. Or when you see palsy, it could refer sometimes to a type of severe cramp that would overtake a person and leave them unable to function. Sometimes this whole body cramp was so severe that it it caused the death of the person within a few days because their entire body um, was 
constricted and unable to function and they, they could not breathe properly, they could not, their, their digestive system was affected and all that type of stuff. Um, so could have been some very different things. The man here in this story, we're not told exactly how, what his condition was, but we know this, that he could not get off of his bed. He was being carried by four men on a, basically a type of a cot, but he was unable to move, um, possibly from the neck down. Maybe he couldn't move anything at all. Everything he did, now you think about this, everything that he did was dependent on somebody else. Could not feed himself, could not clean himself, could not clothe himself, could not work, could not walk. Now, so to back then, uh, there was not a lot of welfare programs and community programs and social working programs for people like this. Um, if you were unable to work and you were very sickly, you were a burden on society, you were a burden on your family. Um, you had to resort, if you had any income at all, to become a beggar, lay on the side of the road with a cup, and you know, compassionate people would come by and throw money at you, and your family could use that to take care of you. That was a terrible life. Can I just tell you that is a horrible, horrible way to live back then? doomed to be a beggar like that. Then the only way this, this type of person could have survived up to this point is because somebody else cared about him. Now think about that. The only way he had even lived up to this point is that somebody had compassion on him. Now I think already, just laying the groundwork for this story, we see a picture of ourselves without Christ. We see a picture of ourselves in our sinful condition. How does the Bible describe us apart from Jesus? Um, Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. We are totally spiritually helpless and hopeless and as beggarly and wretched as you can possibly be apart from Christ. We are bound in our sins. That, that type of bondage being much worse than a physical paralysis. We are spiritually bound and unable to help ourselves unable to better our own condition, we are just totally helpless and bound in sin apart from Jesus Christ. And I believe that this miracle, as a, as a picture, as an analogy, is probably the most appropriate miracle story with which we kick off Missions Month. So that's what we're going to do tonight. I, I apologize. I got something in my eye. Oh my goodness. So I keep, if I start crying, it's not, I don't know what that is. It's like, so anyway, if I blink funny, I'm not giving secret signals to preacher back there or anything like that. Missions is all about bringing people to Jesus. Missions is about sharing the gospel with the lost so that they can believe in Jesus, so that they can receive forgiveness of sins and they can start a personal relationship with God. Uh, we're going to meet people this month. This is Missions Month every year. And not just in March throughout the year as well, but specifically in March, we bring people to the church who are missionaries. They are career missionaries. Now, we'll, we'll preach and teach that every Christian ought to be a missionary in the sense that we all have a responsibility and an obligation by the command of Jesus to share Jesus with others. But missionaries are special folk because they have completely surrendered their life to take the gospel to others. That's what they do with their whole life. They, they, they leave their homes. They leave their families. They go to a strange place, a different place. They learn a strange language in many cases, and they face a different culture to reach people with the gospel. So we're going to meet some missionaries this month who have literally surrendered their lives to preach the gospel. So I want you to remember that, okay, all this month, because we're going to quote some Bible verses that will refer to preaching the gospel. When, I, when you hear me say, we all need to preach the gospel, I want you to understand when I'm saying that, I'm not talking about preach in the same sense that I'm standing up here and preaching tonight, okay? Um, some of you could stand up here and preach uh, in this same way. And maybe, the, maybe some of you will one day, and the, maybe the Lord will give you that opportunity, and, and we praise the Lord for that. But when I say preach in the Bible sense, I'm talking about proclaiming the truth about Jesus, making Jesus known. That's something you have to actively go do to others. I'm going to take Jesus and I'm going to speak of him. I'm going to proclaim him and proclaim his truth to others who do not know him. That's what we're going to be talking about 
all this month of March. So let's read the story, okay? And you know how I like to do, it's my favorite way to preach, is we're just going to read, and as we go, I'm going to make some comments here and there, okay? And I want you to really uh, put yourself there at the scene. Let's imagine what this whole scenario would have been like and see how extraordinary this whole story really is. Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 1, talking about Jesus. And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. Now, let's stop right there for just a second. We've already determined up to this point that wherever Jesus went, it did not take long for crowds to gather. Um, It was always big news when Jesus came to town. And so word traveled very quickly. So Jesus goes into this house. We don't know whose house this is. Uh, Most likely it was Peter's house. If you go back to chapter 1, verses 21 and 29, that's the last house that was mentioned. So it was probably Peter's house. Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law of a fever. So it was probably Peter's house, but whoever's house it was that Jesus went into, they got more than they bargained for this day because a humongous crowd shows up And Jesus does something extraordinary, um, but something else extraordinary happens that led to this miracle. So the thing about crowds is crowds cause problems, okay? Can we just say that? Even peaceful crowds. Now, unruly crowds cause different kinds of problems, but even a peaceful crowd can be a problem. So think about this, all right? Uh, What's the largest number of people you've ever had in your house? What's the biggest number? Somebody give me a number. How, how big do you think is the biggest crowd? <clears throat> okay, 48, 50, that's a big number. Anybody else had maybe 40 people in their house? Anybody have 20 people in their house? Yeah, that's a lot of people, right? Well, you know what happens when you get that much people in one location. Um, it's hard to move. It's hard to get, like just going from the living room to the bathroom is a big ordeal because you got to navigate around people and, you know, things are close quarters. Um, So movement is difficult when the house is packed. Uh, Talking is difficult, speaking and being heard. When you got that many people in a place and there's like 30 different conversations going on, it's hard to discern what's being said, and, you know, if you're not standing right by the person, you might miss what's being said. Well, this is the situation here, okay? This house is packed. Look at verse 2. Straightway, many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. So, now, hospitality was big in this culture back then. It still is, but it was really big. And to open your home to a bunch of guests, especially a uh, kind of a VIP like Jesus, that was, that was a big deal. So this homeowner, whoever he was, opened the doors and said, y'all come on in. And man, they packed in that house. So much so that they packed the house all the way to the door. It's built out of the door into the street. They're crowded around the house. They're probably peeking in windows, trying to get a glimpse, trying to hear. I mean, they have packed this place out. Why? They want to hear Jesus. They want to see Jesus. They want to know what's going on. They want to be there for part of it. What was Jesus doing? Tells us at the end of chapter or verse 2 there, he preached the word unto them. Jesus did not let this opportunity with his big crowd go to waste. He decided, as he always did, to preach truth, to speak the truth. Now, I can't tell you, to my shame, this is a confession here, I cannot tell you the number of times that I've left a conversation with somebody. Could be a stranger, could be an acquaintance, could be somebody um, that I know and care about. And I've left this conversation and afterwards I've thought, why didn't I say something about Jesus? Why didn't I share the gospel with them? Why didn't I share a scripture with them? Why didn't I tell them about what God is doing in my life? Why didn't I pray with them about something? Why was I so content to talk about all these other frivolous things, but I didn't make it a priority to talk about the most important things in the world, the gospel and Jesus and God and heaven and hell? Jesus never suffered from that failure. You realize Jesus never left a conversation and said, I wish I had said something different. He always said exactly the right thing. And he always went right to the heart of the most important 
things. Jesus, I firmly believe, based on everything we know in the Gospels, Jesus was not a chit-chat kind of person. He was not a small talk person. He got right to the heart immediately. So Jesus sees this big crowd, and what's he do? He starts preaching the word of God. He starts sharing truth with these people. And he did that every opportunity that he had. And what was the purpose of Jesus doing that? The same purpose for which we are called to preach the word to people, and that is to bring people into a relationship with Jesus Christ. So missions, I said before, missions is all about bringing people to Jesus. And may we learn from Jesus that we ought to make that the highest priority. So let's keep reading here. Verse 3, they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, that's the condition we just talked about, which was born of four. In other words, he was carried by four people. Now, this man is on some sort of a cot or a pallet that was mobile, trans, you know, transportable, probably. There's four people. There's probably one person on each cor corner. Um, you guys, you probably had to carry a litter, uh, you know, a stretcher type deal, maybe a, a rigged up stretcher. In your training, you know what that's like. Now, we don't know who these people were. We don't know their relation to this sick guy. We don't know how far they came. We have no idea where they're from, how long they've been looking for Jesus. But whatever the case was, I can just tell you probably how shocked they were when they got there and they saw the big crowd. Maybe they thought they were just going to stroll right into Jesus. Maybe they thought, surely Jesus will notice this guy on the bed that we're bringing, you know, the guy that can't move, that's totally paralyzed in his whole body. But no, instead, they get to the house and they can't even barely get to the door. How discouraging that must have been for them. There was no way one person was going to be able to squeeze all the way to the front to meet Jesus, much less five people with one of them laid out horizontally on a stretcher. It just wasn't happening. What do they do now? What's their options? Go home? Give up? Oh, well, we tried. That was, we did the best we could. Give up? Leave? Do we wait? How long is Jesus going to be in there? How long is he going to preach? We could sit out here for a couple hours, maybe. Do they do any of that? No. No, they, uh, they were much more resourceful than that. Okay, let's just say it that way. Look at verse 4. When they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. Now, I want you to remember, this was a guy's house, okay? This was a house. They tore a hole in this man's roof. <laughs> this, this was a big deal. Now, I want you to picture this. Picture the whole process. Don't just cut to the one minute they're outside on the crowd, and the next minute they're, they're up on the roof. This took work. This was a process, all right? They had to get to the roof, first of all. Now, that wasn't too hard back then because those houses, um, they used the rooftop a lot for different things. It was flat. It was made to be a gathering place or a storage place, and there was usually stairs on the outside of the house, so they could get up there. But remember, it's not just a dude walking up the stairs. What are they doing? They're carrying their paralyzed friend. Um, have you ever carried a big, heavy load up some stairs, even with help? It's challenging. It's tiring. And for some reason, dead human body weight is one of the most uh, cumbersome things to carry. It really is. It's, it's, it's amazing. So they had to get this guy to the roof, carried a paralyzed man up there. Then they had to, so the way the roofs were, there was a, a lower thatch-like part of the roof, and then there were harder tiles on the top. So first they had to rip up the tile and whatever way it was fastened in place, whatever way it was maybe ad adhered together, they had to break up the tile. Then they got to the thatch underneath, and they had to dig through the thatch. And while they're digging, where's Jesus? He's in the house underneath. There's dirt falling down. They're making a mess. They're making a racket. I mean, Jesus was teaching, right? Do you think he could continue teaching while... Dirt is falling on his listeners and this loud noise of deconstruction is going on up there. No, I want, I want you to think now. Probably Jesus just had to talk, stop talking. 
And the crowd is probably murmuring, what in the world is going on? Maybe they're panicked. I know the homeowner's panicked, you know. He's probably like, if I could make a break for the door right now, I would and find out what's going on in my house. But he probably couldn't leave because the crowd was so thick. And by the way, how big of a hole did they need to make in the roof? A big one. They let this guy down horizontally on his bed. <laughs> they had, so this was not one little hole that they dug up. This took a long time. I want you to get this picture. This took time and energy, and it was, it was disruptive. And people were probably really mad at them while all this was going on. And all of this for, remember this, there's four guys working here for one man who needed healing. All of this effort and all of this energy, four people are giving because their friend, this one person, needed to see Jesus. Look at verse 5. When he saw their faith, now did that mean all five of them? Did it mean just the four that carried this man? We're not told. But he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now in Matthew, that gospel says that Jesus tells the man, be of good cheer. He probably was not a happy guy. <laughs> he had been laying there in the sun while his friends were doing this for who knows how long. Aggravated, tired, worn out, who knows. Jesus looks at him and he says, be happy, man, cheer up. And what is the next words that he was probably expecting Jesus to say? You're healed. Get up. I'm gonna, you're going to be able to walk today. Is that what Jesus said? <laughs> no. I love this. This is, this is so great. Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. What's going through this guy's mind? Is he disappointed? Is he... Is that all I'm getting? I mean, I believe in you, Jesus, and I'm, that's, that's good. You know, I'm glad. That is a big deal. But I was really wanting to walk again. We don't know. We, we don't know what was going through this guy's mind. I mean, he probably had some faith, obviously. Or, but would he still believe in Jesus if he didn't get healed? Why did Jesus start off with that? Your sins are forgiven. I believe Jesus said exactly what he intended to say, and he always said exactly what he needed to say. And we see that based on the next couple of verses. Look at verses 6 and 7. There were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? What is blasphemy? Well, in its literal sense, blasphemy is to speak evil about or speak evil against God. Who are these guys? The scribes. Remember, the scribes were the experts in all things Jewish. They were the experts in the Old Testament law. They had become expert interpreter, interpreters. Interpreters is not a word. It's not a kind of potato. Uh, they were experts in teaching others how to be good Jewish people. They were revered authorities in Jewish life. They were the authorities ever since the Old Testament time. And so they hear Jesus say that, and to their, their expert minds, they believed that Jesus was diminishing God's glory by taking credit for something that they knew only God could do. By the way, they were right. Nobody can forgive sins but God. They were absolutely right. And in their mind, they're looking at Jesus, and they said, this guy's speaking blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God? That's the whole point. That's why Jesus said it, to testify to who he was. He was claiming divine authority in a way that would not have been proclaimed if he had just healed the man. And by the way, this appears to be the only time in, in the Gospels that Jesus ever told somebody their sins were forgiven. Now, he told people to go and sin no more, but this is the only time he ever said, your sins are forgiven. And so Jesus decided not to let this moment go by without asserting his authority. Look at verse 8. And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they, those scribes, so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk? Now let's just say, that, that's a fair question. 
Jesus said, what's easier to say? Well, if it's just saying something, they're both equally easy to say, right? They're both easy. But what's the harder miracle? Now think about this. What's the harder miracle? To make a paralyzed guy walk or to forgive sins? Which one's more God, God's order of business? Only God could know whether the sins were actually forgiven, but that's exactly what Christ was claiming to do. These people have no way of knowing if this guy's sins are forgiven. That's something only God could know. That's something only God could do. And Jesus was claiming to know that and to do that. So now, Jesus did the great miracle first. He forgave this guy's sins. And now he does the second lesser miracle to authenticate to these people who are watching that the first miracle, the invisible miracle, the sins being forgiven that they couldn't see, he's authenticating that that actually happened. Look at verse 10. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. As he always did. Now, Jesus spoke with complete authority. He had no hesitation or doubt. You know, how many times have you spoken with confidence of something that you really believe was going to happen? How many times have you said, honey, we're going to be on time for church next Sunday. We're not going to be late anymore. I'm tired of being late. We're going to get up early. We're going to get ready. We're going to be there on time. And you speak, so we're going to do it. How many times are you wrong? <laughs> Jesus never had that happen to him. His words were not guesses. They were truth. He spoke with authority. And he told this guy, get up, take up your bed, and go home. And once the man's illness was gone, the man was free to stand up and leave. He came in through a hole in the roof. He left walking out the front door. Now, I had some friends... <clears throat> When I was a young man, when I was a, a teenager and a kid, uh, their grandparents had a superstition. Maybe you've heard about this. If they went into Walmart through one door, they would not come out the same door. Anybody ever heard of people like that? That's, that's strange. I never got that. But anyway, um, this guy, he didn't have a choice. There was no way he's getting back up through that hole in the ceiling. So he got to walk out and praise the Lord, he was healed. Look at verse 12. Immediately he arose, took up the bed and went forth before them all insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw it on this fashion. I believe there's a little bit of a, the, the new word would be shade. There's some shade thrown on the scribes right here. There's some negative slander, because the scribes had been teaching with authority for a long, long time. And they said, we never got anything like this from the scribes. Jesus is way better. He has way more authority. He has way more power than the scribes. We've never seen anybody with this kind of authority before. Jesus was so different, not just his miracles, but just who he was, that they could not help but be amazed and glorify God. What did I tell you from the beginning? What is the purpose of a miracle? To reveal the truth about who God is and who Jesus is and to give a path for people to believe in him. That's exactly what happened in this story as well. What about missions? You're like, this is supposed to be missions, right? Well, that's a great story. I want to correlate this story just briefly. Four things. Our responsibility in missions. We could call it world evangelism, world missions, global missions, whatever you want to call it. How can we learn from this story about what we should be when it comes to taking the gospel to the world? Okay, I'm going to give you four things. Number one, we must have compassion. I touched on that at the very beginning. What was it that moved these four friends to go through all this trouble? Spend a whole day carrying this guy through the streets, climbing up on somebody's roof, basically vandalizing property. Why'd they do all that? Because they really cared about this guy. They really cared. Now, yes, they had faith in Jesus, obviously, but even... Even just having faith that Jesus could do that would not require that much effort. They could sit at home and be like, man, if this guy could get to Jesus, we believe that he could be healed. That required nothing. But they had so much compassion for this man that they took it upon themselves because they cared about him. That's how we must be for the lost of the world. We have to have a heart of compassion for those who do not know Christ. We don't need the kind of compassion that the world is peddling these days. We don't need political compassion. 
We don't need social justice compassion. We just need gospel compassion. Because the reality is everybody without Christ is going to hell for eternity. The world these days is all about who's privileged and who's oppressed. Let me tell you, you can be privileged and go to hell. You can be oppressed and go to hell. That doesn't matter in eternity. What matters is, do you know Jesus Christ? We have to have compassion on people. You might be the only real Christian some people ever meet. You might be the only real Christian, maybe in your family, maybe among your friends and coworkers. You might be the only real Christian they'll ever come into contact with. They may never pick up a Bible. They may never watch the passion of the Christ or another evangelistic film or, or, or courageous or fireproof or those great movies. They might never watch any of those things, but they can see you. Don't expect them to just pick up a Bible one day. Take the gospel to them. Be compassionate. Who's going to reach them if we don't reach them? We have to have that heart of compassion. What does the heart of compassion do? It compels us to take action. We must take action. Number two. Again, these guys didn't have to do this. Even if they cared about their friend, they didn't necessarily have to go through all this trouble. But they took action. They worked together to get this guy close to Jesus. They made it a priority in their life. They carried him. They went up on this roof. They didn't even know who it, whose house it was. They tore up this house. So I want you to think about this. Their, their actions were intentional. All right? They had a plan. Get this guy to Jesus. What happened? First plan didn't work out. So what did they do? They had flexible actions. They came up with a plan B. Their first plan failed, so they tried again. They, they were persistent. They were diligent. They, they were creative. And I think we are so quick to give up on those who need Jesus. I think we're so quick. We get shot down one time. We get, we get a conversation cut off one time. We blow it one time. Anybody ever tried to share the gospel and you just wound up sounding like a goofball who had no idea what you were talking about? I have. I really have. And uh, we think, well, that's it. There's no way. I totally lost it. That guy's never getting saved. We're so quick to give up. Be diligent. Be persistent. And by the way, not just in sharing the gospel personally, but how many actions can you take to help get the gospel to the world? Don't be content to just give one offering to missions a year, if that, and just think, well, I did it. I gave to missions one time. We're good. Conscience is appeased. Maybe somebody will get saved out of all that. Don't be content to do that. Don't be satisfied to just pray one time for a missionary. Maybe you have a missionary come here to the church and, and uh, you feel really burdened and you're, Lord, I, I hope they get to the field and they really do a great job and you pray one time for that missionary and you never pray for them again. Don't be content to do that. Be persistent. William Carey I've uh, told this story before, and you, you know it. He was considered one of the pioneers of what we think of as, as missions. And he was a cobbler. He, he worked on shoes. And he hung a world map up above his workbench. And as he was working on people's shoes, he would look at the map of the world, and he would weep, literally weep, and pray as he thought about all the people in the world who were dying without Jesus Christ and going to hell. And he would weep. Now here's the thing. That's not all he did. Eventually, he wept so much and he cared so much that he went. He wasn't content just to do one thing. He started a movement. He raised awareness to the need. He pretty much single-handedly started what we think of as modern missions and mobilized Christians to take Jesus to the world. Take action. Do what you can. Share the gospel with who you can. Support missions through your church. Go if, if, you, if you can. The world needs to hear the gospel. Thirdly, we must work with urgency. We, we really don't know what kind of state this guy was in. I mentioned before, that these types of paralysis could be deadly. It's possible he was very close to death. We don't know. But the point is this. They weren't willing to just wait. They didn't do a lot of waiting. They were very urgent. 
They wouldn't even wait for Jesus to be done in the house and to come out in the street. They went into him. They were very, they had, a, they had a sense of urgency. They reached the point where they decided, I can't be passive anymore. I've got to do something. And they were, there was an urgency to their work. They didn't wait for an opportunity or wait for a moment. They created an opportunity to take this person to Jesus. Pray that God would give you that same, that same sense of urgency. I have to pray every year. I do. Every single, especially around missions conference, I pray that God would stoke my my heart and stir my heart to realize just how urgent and important this work is. It's a few years ago we had the, the missions theme that was all about time. I don't know if you remember that one. And uh, we, had a, we had a clock up here or a, a, a screen up here that was counting off how many people died and went into eternity while the service was going on. And you just see, you could see that number climbing and climbing. How many people every minute of every day die and go into a godless eternity? How many people go and spend eternity in hell because they don't know Jesus? The need is urgent. Number four, we must keep the faith. What did Jesus compliment these men on? What did he notice about them? It wasn't their creativity or their boldness, their audacity, their energy, their effort, their time. No, it says he saw their faith. Their faith is what caused them to bring this man to Christ. You know, what you think about world missions actually says a lot about your faith. How important you feel it is to share the gospel with others really speaks a lot about your faith. Answer this question in your heart. What do you think the world needs most of all? What do you think are the top needs? Don't say it out loud, but what do you think? You ask different people that, and they'll say all kinds of different things. You know, peace, peace from war, political peace. Um, we need to do something about the environment. We need, we need a Green New Deal. That's the, most, that's the most crucial thing. That's the most urgent thing. Some people would say that. Some people would say we need social justice. We need to re- relieve the oppressed. But whatever it may be. What's your answer to that? What is the thing the world needs the most? What's the number one need of the world? Do we really truly believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do we really truly believe He saved sinners? He died on the cross for our sins. Do we really believe that the world needs Jesus so they're going to go to hell for eternity? It says a lot about your faith, what you do with world missions. It takes a lot of faith to preach the gospel. Can I tell you that? It takes a lot of faith. You have to believe that Jesus is who He says He is. You have to believe that others are going to die and spend eternity in hell if they don't know Christ as their Savior. You have to really believe that. You have to believe that sharing the gospel with others is the right thing to do, even if they hate you for it, even if they persecute you, even if they slam the door in your face, cuss you out, whatever the case may be, even if they reject you. You may have to try over and over and over again. You think that doesn't take a test of faith right there? You have to keep the faith. Billions of people are going to spend an eternity in hell if they don't trust Christ. And here's the thing. You can do something about that. Now, you can't save people. I can't save people. But we can bring them to the one who can. And that's what these men did. By the way, start with the people you know. That's what these guys did. They were bringing somebody they cared about to Jesus. What will it take for you to share the gospel with somebody that you know? An awkward conversation, perhaps? Maybe a letter? Maybe you invite them to church? Maybe you share your testimony with them? Maybe you blow it a couple of times and, again, say something goofy? What's, is it worth continuing? Yes. What's going to stop you? Reach the world. Start with those you know and then reach out into the world. Participate in your church. Pray for those who are proclaiming Jesus. Pray for those who need to hear Man, adopt a missionary. We used to do that, but it's been a long time. But we've, we've got over 70 missionaries and families and, and organizations that we support. Pick one and just pray for them. Get a burden for a field. We've got these missionaries coming this month. Um, pray about which of these fields do you have a burden for? Which, which of these fields do you want to take an interest in? Take some action. And here, I want to leave you with this, okay? You might be sitting here and think, 
I'm little old me from Spring Lake, North Carolina, little bitty church. What can I do? You will never know just how greatly God can use you until you try. Jesus healed all kinds of people. There were other people who brought people to Jesus besides these four guys. They probably had no idea that they were going to be captured in the Gospels. By the way, three of the Gospels tell this story. They, had, they probably had no idea that this was going to be used to edify the faith of millions of believers for years and years and years and years to come. They had no idea when they started out, let's, let's do what we can to get this man to Jesus. They had no idea how God was going to use them. The same is true about you. You don't know what the, the repercussions are going to be. You don't know what, what God can take your little bit. God can take your loaves and your fishes, which we're going to talk about in a couple weeks, and do great things with them. Let me just end with this. I've talked a lot about us as believers taking the gospel to unbelievers. Maybe you're here tonight and you're not saved. Maybe you don't know Christ. Maybe you're here and you're still in your sins and you need to have your sins forgiven by Jesus. Um, I mentioned a minute ago, what's the number one need of the world? Well, if that's you tonight, your number one need is Jesus Christ. Your number one need is to have your sins forgiven. Your number one need is for you to believe the gospel that Jesus died for your sins on the cross and rose again the third day for you. That's your number one need right now. And I talked about urgency. The Bible presents... The Bible presents it so urgent that if you don't know Christ, don't put it off. Today is the day of salvation. The command in Scripture is always, or the exhortation, is always to believe now, to come to Jesus now. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Do it now. It's urgent. It's a need. We're not guaranteed another minute of life. Believe in Him now. I want to read this. This is... Uh, this was from John Phillips, who is a, he was a great preacher from Wales. He was born in Wales. He lived in Chicago for a while. Um, Bible commentator, wrote a lot of commentary, uh, commentaries and books. He died back in 2010. Got, actually got to hear him in person in college, but he wrote this on this passage. I want you to listen to these words, okay? He says this, A profound truth is embedded in the Lord's words. And this is here in verse... Uh, this is, embedded, this is in verse 10, if you want to read there. A profound truth is embedded in the Lord's words, that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. If our sins are to be forgiven, it must be while we are still on earth. It will be too late once we are dead, because both character and destiny are fixed at death. The solemn pronouncement is this, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. That comes from Revelation twenty two eleven. The Bible offers no hope of redemption beyond the grave. A path runs from earth to heaven, and a path runs from earth to hell, but no path runs from hell to heaven. Purgatory is a myth. We get our sins forgiven on earth or not at all. And the one who has power on earth to forgive sins is the Son of Man alone. He has delegated that power to no one else. Do you know Jesus that way? Is He your Savior? Is He your Lord? Are you counting on some other means of salvation? You won't find it. I've heard so many people say, uh, when I get to, you know, if there is a God when I stand before Him, I'm going to tell Him I wasn't that bad of a person or... You didn't give me enough evidence to believe that you're really there. None of that is going to stand before the Lord. You've got one life and one opportunity and only one to believe the truth about God and believe the truth about Jesus. You need to believe now. So I want to ask you all, bow your head and close your eyes. And I want you to answer in your heart as truthfully as you can, as honestly as you can, do I know Jesus Christ as my personal Savior? Ask yourself that question. Do I know Jesus Christ as my personal Savior? Am I 100% sure my sins have been forgiven? 
Am I 100% sure if I died today, right now, tonight, that I would be in the presence of God for eternity? I would go to heaven. Some people say, oh, that's impossible. You can't know for sure. Yes, you can. On the authority of God's word, you absolutely can. If you don't know for sure, if you could not answer yes to those questions, can I invite you to to throw all of your trust and all of your faith in Jesus Christ tonight and let Him be your Savior and let Him say to you, your sins are forgiven. You could pray something very simple. There's no magic words, there's no magic prayer. But you could pray something to the Lord like this. Dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I need to be saved. I believe that you died on the cross for me. And I believe that I can't do anything to save myself. I'm trusting in you. Please save me, Lord. Come into my heart and be my Savior today. And if you pray something like that and you truly mean it in your heart, if it's words that come from your heart and and reflect the faith that you have, and it's not just something you're repeating because I said it. If that's you, then, then the Bible, on the, on the authority of Jesus Christ, you have had your sins forgiven today. And if you've prayed that prayer, maybe recently, maybe in this church service, or you watch this video later, and, and you pray that prayer, would you please let us know? We want to rejoice. This is, this is why we're here. This is, nothing excites us more than to see people come to Christ. And that's why we do Missions Month and that's why we support 70-something missionaries. This is, this is why we exist. Please let us know. We'd love to help you grow in Christ and do anything we can to get the gospel to the world. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your, your blessings tonight. Uh, Lord, this simple message, my, my words are not profound. My words are not powerful. But Lord, your words are. Your truth is. And you, Lord, are the the only Savior for mankind. You're the only one who can forgive sins. The one thing that the scribes got right here in this passage. And I pray, Lord, if anybody's heard this message, not knowing you as Savior, that they would not wait another moment, but that they put their trust and faith in you. And for us who are believers, Lord, give us that that renewed compassion, that renewed fire, that, that burden to see the lost come to know you. Use this month, this missions month, to ignite that fire in our heart, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Brother John, thank you for the good message tonight. It's good to see you. Appreciate you being here tonight. Appreciate you all joining us. This is missions month, and uh, we'll hear more challenges about missions throughout the month, and a great opportunity for you uh, you know, we want the missionaries to come be a blessing to us. We want to find out where they're going. Katie Dill, we're going to South Africa. You know, we're going to know all about uh, what she's going to do. But, you know, we can be a blessing to them. And that's just go, greet them, spend some time with them, let them know you appreciate uh, them being here. And uh, uh, you never know. You never know that missionary, what it was like at the last church. Uh, that Not all missionaries get treated like we treat them at Lake Chapel Baptist Church. And just believe me, and uh, especially Katie, she's a single missionary, and she has struggles and challenges that uh, missionary families do not. So uh, pray and attend and be here. Uh, here's a little trivia question. And now if you are uh, staff and family of Lake Chapel Baptist Church, you're ineligible, Okay. Uh, or you've ever been on the missions committee, all right? You cannot. Do you know the longest-serving missionary or mission project that the church has supported for over 30 years? Longest-serving missionary mission project the church has support, supported for over 30 years. You've probably heard me say it, Brother John say it. Anybody know? How about you all at home? Okay, yeah. You have to turn your sound up, all right? I, I don't see any hands, all right? Anybody? Anybody got an idea? Durham Rescue Mission. Yes, you win a free mask, all right? Good deal. All right. 
Congratulations, that's very good. Now here's one for Sunday. We need you to tell us what missionary do we support that has the most children? That's kind of an easier one if you've kind of been around a little bit. You know, I know you can't say it back there. Nope, nope, nope. But uh, see if you know that and you can tell us on Sunday. And uh, we're looking forward to it. Well, send your update uh, or any requests that you have. If you'll send it to us, we'll put that out in the morning and uh, send our prayer list, excuse me, prayer list out. And uh, again, thank you for being here. It's an encouragement when you are here uh, here on Wednesday nights or on Sundays also. So let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for this church. Thank you, Father, for a church that's mission-minded. And we'll have an opportunity this coming month uh, to be able to be surrounded by the need around the world of missions. Uh, we pray for Katie as she comes to be with us, give her safety. And then, Father, help us to be an encouragement to this young lady. Uh, bless her ministry. And, uh, Lord, we want to pray in advance for uh, the prayer requests are on our hearts, the ones we'll send out tomorrow, that you would have your will and way in each and every heart. And, uh, again, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the good word tonight. We pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.